Albert Ottoman Hookblade has two parts, you see. What's up, everybody? I'm The Hook. And I'm The Blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the Hook Pod Bladecast, the only <laughs> Assassin's Creed podcast. The only one. The only one that exists. Tim, what's something you don't like about you? Uh, you know, I'm really not a fan of my toes. You know, it's okay. It's normal to have toe-related anxiety. <laughs> Today, we're going to start off with a segment that we like to call the Valhalla News Roundup. We got a bunch of new pieces of information from the PlayStation magazine. And uh, what I'm going to do, Tim, is I'm just going to throw these at you one by one. And I want you to respond to each one with anything from a word to a full sentence, but no longer than a full sentence. Okie dokie. Number one, no fetch quests and characters that disappear shortly after. Wow. Side quest characters will remain in the world and may move to your settlement. Nice. Some side quests will adopt a Shakespearean five-act structure. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going as I'd hoped. <laughs> uh, your raven, whose name I can't pronounce but is spelled like Sinan, uh, can find monasteries for Eivor to plunder. I I want to plunder things. What does Eivor have against monasteries is my question. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be the big narrative question of this game. The Hidden Blade's positioning fits with Eivor's culture to be up front in your battles, so it's his philosophical reason to do so. Yeah, I mean, that's very uh, social stealthy. I'm curious if this means that we're going to get a moment where the assassin gives him the Hidden Blade and then all he does is just rotate it on his arm. <laughs> I, yeah, I, just, I, I just pictured that. He's like, okay, no, this is. He's stupid. like, this doesn't work for me. <laughs> he spins it. Or no, or rather, he just like rotates the entire like van brace. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just, and it's upside down. Does it make sense to do it like that? Not at all. But, <laughs> you know, I guess we'll see how it goes. Your settlement storylines will parallel and overlap, and as it evolves, you as a leader will have to make tough decisions. I bet. The location for your settlement is decided by a, quote, very specific narrative reason. We haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> there are a lot of very specific narrative reasons for things. and Yeah, there's a lot of unique and specific narrative, <laughs> narrative decisions in this game. And you know what? I think that's a good sign. You know, hey, I think that's a good thing. Valhalla will bridge the gap between the Hidden Ones and the Assassins, as well as the Order of the Ancients and the Templars. I've said this to you, and yeah. I'll, say it, I'll say it here, you know, so that people will know. I think that there's a chance that we'll at least see the beginnings of, like, a Masyaf. Yeah. I or, think like, this, an Alamut castle. Yeah, I can confirm that Tim has said this to me before and isn't just <laughs> making it up on the spot right now. But that is something he said, and I... Now believe that that is completely true, but I really am curious how they're going to make that interesting beyond the level of a group of hidden ones being like, we need a new name. <laughs> <laughs> we need a new castle. Oh, hidden ones. That's so dorky and ancient Egypt sounding. <laughs> <laughs> we need a new band name, guys. Need, guys. I, I like the idea, like, maybe it's just, like, they got a new lead singer, which is, like, yeah. Eivor. And then Order and of, cool the name. Order of the Ancients is also, like, if they're having a new name, we need a new <laughs> name, too. <laughs> um, Darby was inspired by Egil's Saga. I, I know I'm not pronouncing that right. It could be Egil, Egil, Eagle. There are too many questionable letters in that name. Mm -hmm. An Icelandic saga that features a family as they fight with another Viking family over land and treasures. I looked up the book and I went to add it to my reading list and then realized I'm probably never going to read it. <laughs> How long is your reading list at this point? 120 books. You know, you also have to read the uh, Michael Crichton novel that Ashraf said got him into Vikings. Right. Yeah. Probably won't read that one either. I also keep hearing that I'm supposed to watch The Last Kingdom on Netflix. Will I probably do that? Maybe. <laughs> I have a personal vendetta against Timothy Chalamet. He's not in that. Are you? Oh, wrong show. <laughs> <laughs> he's in The what's, King. What's the medieval show that he's in? It's a movie, and it's called The King. <laughs> I think. Look, okay, I'm going to just lay this out there. I don't have a Netflix account. Yeah, and also... I think it's a tradition now for you to just think I'm talking about something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, but it's funny because that was both times were not planned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. 
All right, that wraps up our inaugural segment of the Valhalla News Roundup. Let's jump into the actual topic, the uh, the meat and potatoes of this episode, if you will. We're here to talk about The Fall and the Chain. The Fall and the Chain are a pair of graphic novels. They're like little three-issue collections uh, that were released between 2010 and 2012. So we're kind of going back to the, the early days as Assassin's Creed was really solidifying what it was going to be. And it's a really interesting comic to look back on because first of all it's a really fucking good comic both both of the books the fall and the chain are fantastic and second of all it's kind of your first glimpse at what assassin's creed's ambitions were as a transmedia franchise of saying absolutely we can cover multiple time periods we can track this story over many settings and we can tell stories that intertwine with each other across various forms of media and honestly, I mean, those early comics were really off to a great start. I mean, it was only until recently when we got like all these different spinoffs of the of games and mangas and whatnot. It just it always just it's all disjointed nowadays. But back then, it it was very focused. And this comic, I think, really showcases that because it's not fifteen issues long. It's a very succinct story. Yeah, they really took the opportunity they had presented to them as well because. You know, as most people know, Daniel Cross, the main character of these comics, features in Assassin's Creed 3. And I went back and I watched the Daniel Cross scenes from Assassin's Creed 3, like all two of them. Mm -hmm. And like, while it's not, I mean, it's not amazing. He's he's kind of <sighs> the way that they portray him. And this is out of necessity due to the fact that they only could put him on screen for like five minutes or whatever is very much like the extreme version of what he is in the comics. I mean, in the comics, he has schizophrenia type of affliction based on his experiences with the genetic memories. And then in the game, he's all like, get out of my head! <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Like, it's, it's much more violent. Like a it's cartoon version of what that schizophrenia affliction would look like. Yeah, I mean, he's so wasted in that game. I mean, like, I, I won't get too deep into it just because we're talking about this Daniel Cross. But yeah. just compared to this Daniel Cross... Like there was, there was, there seemed to be like no, um, what's the word? They just, they weren't true to what they built up in this, in this book. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. Like I, I think with the limited role that they chose to have for him in this game, I, I, I believe that, and this might not be the case. I believe that the comic came first and that while they were developing Assassin's Creed three, they knew that this comic was being written. So they went, oh, okay, we can maybe pull from that. And work it in here. Right. And with that in mind, if he's just going to be sort of a mini boss that Desmond has to take down on his way to, to fuck up Warren Vidic, then yeah, to include him and they want to hint at the depth of his character. They want to hint at who he is and they want to be true to it. So they have to kind of play it way the hell up. So like there's this conversation you can hear if you don't kill him immediately, if you just sneak around, he calls Warren Vidic on the phone and he talks about how he has to get back into the animus. He mentions in a Kenti Kenya by name. That's all like pretty accurate to the vibe of yeah. him in the comic for sure. For sure. It's just that they have to be really on the nose with it so that you know that like this is that guy. Right. And yeah, and I guess that does kind of bring up the issue or, or I guess the the, the wrinkle that not everyone that plays Assassin's Creed three is going to have read this comic. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, but, but I would argue and, you know, not to get too much, too hung up on like what he is in the game, but I, I just, in terms of him coming from the pages into the game and whatnot, I think he should have been like an Otso Burke. Yeah. Post Vidic. He should have been like the, like the guy that's going to fuck your shit up just because he was built up in this comic as we'll get into, like as mm -hmm. like a fucking like, he's like the Darth Vader of Assassin's Creed in the comic book. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's like Rogue One-esque Darth Vader, you know, like he is, uh, he's a force to be reckoned with. There's some parallels like with the idea of Anakin. He's aimless. He's, he doesn't have a purpose. He sees both sides as having the, as giving him the purpose that he's seeking in life. Um, and he chooses one over the other for more personal reasons than for ideological reasons. And that's part of what makes him such an effective enforcer for either side is that he's skilled and completely devoted um, because to him, these organizations are the only thing giving his life structure and meaning. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you and none, none of this, like 
none of what happened is really Daniel's fault at the end of the day. Yeah. Like he's a victim. Yeah, he is. I, I feel like it's implied that, I mean, he was being stuck into the animus since he was a child. Oh no, it's confirmed. He's, he was in the animus as a little boy. Right. Yeah. And they particularly that- exposed him to it in the most raw and, and traumatizing way. Yeah, because he's, like, walking down the street naked and alone. And and let's, real quick, before we get too far into this, too, let's kind of give a brief overview of the events. Because a lot of the people listening to this either won't have read the comic necessarily or will have read it such a long time ago that they don't necessarily remember all of the events. So if I were to give, like, a very quick boilerplate summary, it would be that um, Daniel Cross, he is a, a sort of alcoholic bum drug addict, loner, loser, who has these hallucinations of a Russian family. He gets sort of intercepted by the assassins because he has this assassin tattoo. They train him. They harness his potential uh, because he can see in these hallucinations he has the experiences of his ancestor, Nikolai Orlov. And as far as the assassins know at the time, this is like 1999, 2000, there's no way to their knowledge, to actually experience genetic memories, but they do know that genetic memory exists. This makes Daniel Cross like a super assassin Jedi type of dude with that kind of ability. He undergoes this mission to get close to the mentor, the mysterious shadowed leader of the Assassin Brotherhood. In trying to get close to the mentor, he meets assassins all over the world. He experiences all of their training cells. Finally, the mentor finds him. He meets him and He kills the mentor because he is a sleeper agent. All of the genetic memories he's experiencing are flashbacks to animus experiences that he was forced to have as a small child, wherein he was programmed to get close to the mentor and take him out for the Templars. After this, he becomes, you know, a Templar superstar, basically. Um, He experiences the memories of Nikolai's son in Akenti, and sees how he gets trained pretty viciously by his father. Hopefully that gives you an overview. Is there anything important that I left out, Tim? Um, No, I mean, just aside from uh, Daniel Cross is a handsome motherfucker. Yeah, I guess if you like dudes whose mouths and noses are way too close together. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, uh, plenty of women in this book do. Well, I shouldn't say plenty. I mean, like, just one, really. Everyone else kind of thinks he's a loser. There's I some. Guess. There's some weird stuff with women in this book. They're either like, take me, Daniel, or Daniel, we talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> or or both. Or, or both, both. Or at the same time. The yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird stuff. There's like a very explicitly implied date rape that goes on in the background of a comic panel that is yeah. never dealt with at all. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah, he's in the bathroom throwing up, I think, and the guy's like, yeah, just one more drink in her and she won't be able to turn me down. Not like, funny or cool at all, but that is there. Great strategy. Like, And uh, Daniel goes, for, I love this, his, he's like, he kind of makes these flirtatious overtures at, at Hannah, an assassin lady who finds him. And he's like, you're like a, you're like a hot ninja. <laughs> <laughs> and then like a year later when they've turned him into handsome Squidward because he's an assassin <laughs> with purpose now, uh, she's like, hey, Daniel, um... I could maybe like, I could maybe stay over. And he's just like, <laughs> he's like, nah, no need, Hannah. I have all the companionship I need in my fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Hannah, I think I'm just going to hallucinate for the night. I think Thanks, I'm just going to chill with the voices tonight, Hannah. <laughs> I think I'm taking a trip to Russia tonight, if you know what I mean, <laughs> Hannah. I'm going to uh, pretend to be Nikolai and pretend to have sex with his wife, who (laughs) coincidentally never ages visibly. (laughs) I don't know if you noticed this, but Nikolai, he gets older every single panel of the book. (laughs) And his wife just stays looking 30 for the whole thing. Nikolai is literally like a skeletal grandpa in the chain. (laughs) And you see his wife and she looks like baby faced. I don't know. Are they trying to say something about Russian women? Cause I, I did not notice that to be honest with you. I didn't notice this. They gave her like an eye wrinkle and called it a fucking day. I was too busy at looking at his mustache to really notice anything oh, else. What a good mustache. It's such I a know. good mustache. I know. I hope that if, hey, if that kid is worth his salt when he gets older, he'll have a mustache like that. 
Right? That's what Daniel Cross needed was a mustache. That would have <laughs> solved all his problems. Yeah, yeah, because it would have given some surface area between his nose and mouth. I am really curious what... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, it took me a moment to realize how funny that was. <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious what happened to Inakenti after the chain, because the last time we see this guy in any official Assassin's Creed media, he is like a little little kid. And that dude would have such an interesting life after that childhood. You'd have to wonder if he like eventually would c- come into contact with an assassin. And like, hey, like, what the fuck is... What do you, how do you have one of our hidden blades, child? They say pretty explicitly someone in the book like Warren Vidic or or someone on the Abstergo side says that uh, that the Orlov family had two generations of assassin activity. So let me ask you, do we know if Nikolai's father was an assassin? Um, I don't think I you know what? I, yeah. Uh, Dude, are you OK? <laughs> I am legitimately like having a stroke thinking about this. I want to say um, he, he mentions at the beginning that like this, like my father wanted this life for me. Um, so perhaps I, Oh I yeah. Think okay. So I, I just Googled that. it. I literally Googled Nikolai Orlov father. Um, Andre immigrated to Russia and became a devoted member of the Narodnaya Volya, um, which is a left wing terrorist offspring of the Russian assassin brotherhood. So I suppose, Interesting. yeah. So, <laughs> so Andre was an assassin, which confirms that in all likelihood in was not. And that makes sense. Maybe. I mean, cause he had no knowledge of what the of what the Templars are. He, and he probably didn't even have any knowledge like that, that those men were assassins. So he, he'll probably just try and survive on his, on his lonesome. Um, that's the thing is he'll probably have to be on the run forever because I'm sure the assassins are going to try and hunt the Orlovs down forever. Yeah. And and we don't really know what happened to the, you know, the piece uh, on his necklace either. Really? Yeah. About the whole uh, staff thing. I will say, it's interesting for Nikolai to hoard that knowledge just because like I can understand if he's like, yeah, I mean like these assassin guys, they don't really know what they're dealing with or whatever. But like, is that information really being used effectively if you don't even like tell your son about it? You know, like he's just keeping it to himself. And like, I feel like whatever he saw for him to hoard on to that knowledge and not share it with anyone and even like other assassins, seems a little selfish to me. You know, I, yeah, that makes, I agree with you. Like, I think that Nikolai is one of the, he's a really interesting character um, because he's not like any other assassin we've really seen before in terms of his relationship to the brotherhood. We do see that he is devoted. We do see that he is passionate about the cause and what they are trying to do. Um, But it feels to me like once he interacts with the staff and he has this, this sort of vision of what it's capable of, he starts to maybe see the assassins and their conflicts as maybe not that important in the grand scheme of things yeah, because yeah. that's kind of when he decides to like, you know, fuck this shit. We're going to America and we're going to get away yeah. from all of this. Uh, yeah. I mean, the last stuff. thing he does is just track down that last piece and then he's, then he's done. I mean, he doesn't even bother like, like even, um, yeah, he just is like, I don't care anymore. I'm just here for th- for the staff. I'm not going to kill you. Just to, to kind of reference the, the book. Yes. He gets a letter from Vladimir Lenin basically saying what we really need you to do now is kill Tsar Nicholas, um, mm-hmm. who has abdicated the throne. Right. It's 1917. The Russian Revolution is in full swing, um, but he still needs to die because in the eyes of Lenin and the other assassins, his life represents, you know, the image of monarchy and, and autocracy that right. the revolution seeks to quell. So he says, Nikolai, listen, do, do me a favor. Just kill this motherfucker. But Nikolai goes and he, uh, you know, accosts Tsar Nicholas. And he's like, basically, I'm actually here uh, because I've seen you wielding the staff. And I thought the staff was destroyed, but I just want to make sure that it's that it's gone. And Tsar Nicholas is like, look at the staff. And he's like, yeah, this is a bad wood replica. It's not the real staff at all. So he breaks it with his leg. And he's like, I'm not going to kill you because I don't really care about this shit. Um, I'm going to America now. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't He doesn't really care to just to talk with phony collectors. But Nicholas, for reasons I maybe don't fully understand, he's like, I do know this one motherfucker who's wearing like a shard of something around his neck. 
that yeah. has the same properties as what you describe of the staff. So he goes and collects that. And that's what the assassins are looking for when they hunt him and Inakenti down in America. Yes. And and also, um, I they have some form of idea that there was knowledge linked to the staff and to the incident that left him, you know, all tattered in the factory or, or the Tesla warehouse. thing. Right. Yeah. This leaving that completely gone, you know, and leaving only him surviving. I mean, they, they knew something had to have happened. And also, yeah, what this is really kind of all in service of is creating a really interesting story where Nikolai has this experience where he's confronted with the whole of time and, you know, the, the awareness of this greater reality beyond himself, beyond the assassins. And just decides that really the only thing that makes sense for him to do is to step away from this life and and live a normal life with his family, uh, which, of course, the assassins deprive him of. And that's what's also really interesting is, A, we have a character who leaves the assassins for really interesting reasons. This is no Assassin's Creed rogue, you slaughtered innocent sort of thing, right? <laughs> yes. Also, we have an Assassin's Brotherhood that is pretty... Um, they're not they're not the coolest guys ever, are they, huh? No, <laughs> they're not they very definitely, nice. Yeah, they're 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 no Italian brotherhood. Which makes some sense when you consider that if the assassins in Russia are doing what they're doing in service of the Bolsheviks and in service of the revolution, well, we know from history that uh after taking over the Bolsheviks were also not that fucking cool, huh? No, they were not that <laughs> nice. They, they kind of didn't do a great job or <laughs> restore much peace, all things considered, did they? Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it was just like salt in the wound, if anything. So I guess if you're going to turn the Russian Revolution into an Assassin Templar conflict, you kind of have to make it so that the, that the Assassins are not the coolest guys. Right, the, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of... Of, of gray area with that. Um, I mean, the assassin that is tussling with, with, with Nikolai, you know, he says that you were intended to be with your family. We take care of our own. But how are you even going to believe what he's saying? And that's the thing is perhaps he's telling the truth. But he also could not be in that, you know, the the whole Red Scare incident, they weren't intended to be kept together. And they, and they just were trying to get to Nikolai. You know, and well, I mean, we, we kind of know that he wasn't completely lying, considering that uh, his daughter survives. Are we certain that they are still alive, though, after the Red Scare incident? Well, this is pretty subtextual, but it's not like the subtlest thing ever. But Daniel Cross goes to the church and he's talking to that woman and he says he's visiting family. And then they both look right at the camera and wink. <laughs> Interesting. I <laughs> I legitimately thought that that was just his oh, like awakening of faith. I think that the woman there is supposed to be uh who would she be? Okay, so I guess it'd be his, his daughter if anything. It couldn't be his wife cuz she doesn't age. <laughs> That's a great point. I don't know. I think that it's definitely implied that that is an Orlov woman. I got to say that I got, I did not get that impression at all. Mm. Um, that makes sense. Like I believe, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I thought he said he was visiting family because I mean, Christ is all of our family. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like to. To touch on something, though, um, I, I did have something to say about D Daniel in this. And uh, so if you don't mind, if I do bring up this 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 incident in the modern day. Um, Give me just so, one second, because I'm seeing if the Internet yeah. will answer our question about uh, about whether or not his family is the Russian woman or Christ. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. OK, I can confirm the woman in the church is Nadia Orlov. Who said who said that? Um, it's in the biography on the Assassin's Creed wiki. Uh, Nadia married and had at least one child, a son. Many years later, in 2002, she met a young man in a church in Moscow, not realizing that it was her great nephew, Daniel Cross. Without knowing it, she also possessed Rasputin's shard of the Imperial Scepter, which had splintered from its parent staff when the artifact was destroyed in the Tunguska explosion by her father. So she is apparently 
wearing the shard. Wow, I guess I just read those last pages with my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I'm uh nothing gets past me. Can I <laughs> Okay, so we, we answered that question. Um, so you wanted to say... Yes, so uh, when uh, Daniel is doing his mission into the library of, uh, I guess uh, it was Ivan the Terrible, correct? His library, um, his underground secret library, and he kills the assassin guarding it. He the, finds, the hippie um, assassin? The hippie, the hippie assassin. Safety and peace, man. Uh, <laughs> effectively the dude, almost. Um, you can cut that out. That wasn't a good joke. So... I'm going to leave all of that in. He finds Ezio's codex, um, which is awesome. Uh, yes, it is. And he reads it and, and, and he sees Ezio's, you know, rec- um, account of the Minerva thing. And that propels Daniel because he sees the mention of Desmond through Minerva. And he's like, who the fuck is Desmond? <laughs> which is great like, because at who- that time, Desmond's like, what, three? <laughs> I mean... Well, no. Uh, in two, well, in two thousand two, no, he, he was yeah, like he, he was ten years younger, so he was probably about 12, 11, 10, something like that. Was he that young in the first game? Well, okay, how old is he in twenty twelve? Like thirty something? I would imagine. Then yeah, he's probably I, twenty in two thousand. Dude, so I'm really bad at math. Okay. <laughs> the point being is like that basically is supposed to be the incident that puts their eyes on Desmond or trying to find Desmond, which is Desmond, fucking awesome. It's an excellent, uh, like prequel device. However, yeah. it creates a wrinkle and here's why. Ooh. Just because I know we often praise the older games for having this like modern day consistency and they do. <laughs> and, well, no, but they more than today. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, so yeah, it's by comparison. My point being here is we know that, Daniel Cross reads that and he's like, okay, this fucking Desmond guy, he's important somehow. So, Absurgo, we got to get him. Yeah. And so in the first game, you know, they retrieve Desmond. They're like, all right, you're going to relive some memories for us because we want to get this apple of Eden. Or we want to get this piece of Eden. And, you know, we want to stick it uh, in our satellite, which is not explicitly mentioned. But yeah. anyway, the, the problem becomes is if Daniel Cross discovered that Desmond was linked to this Minerva thing with Ezio, why, when they capture him, they're bothering going back with Altair? Like, why even go through Altair's memories in the first place? You could reasonably suggest that, okay, so if they're investigating these bloodlines enough, they, they'll know that the assassin Altair must have come into contact with a piece of Eden or multiple or however. And so, yeah, it's valuable information to be harvested there. But if you're trying to figure out what the fuck Minerva is saying to him, you would be it would stand to gain that you would go through Ezio's uh, memories. And but I don't think they are trying to find out what Minerva is saying to him. Well, why else? Why else would they think that he's in, uh, um, you know a person of interest? Okay, so I mean, for one thing, all of that's written down, so they know what Minerva said to him. Yeah, but they don't know the context around it. Is there much context surrounding it? I mean. All they know is essentially what what Ezio heard and what he decided to write down. So Yeah. Well, yeah, but that 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 creates an even bigger problem because then you have this whole thing where it's like, okay, so in Assassin's Creed 2, we're going to break out Desmond and he's going to go, you know, and meet him and Lucy are going to hang out with Sean and Rebecca. Yeah. And the idea that Lucy is this secret Templar isn't even a, an, an idea yet. And so it gets more convoluted as it goes because the whole idea behind Project Saren was that we're going to get Desmond, take him out of Absurgo, and get him in a more comfortable place so that it'll it'll happen uh, more uh, organically. Okay. But if the objective is to just find an apple of Eden, which is the objective for Project Saren, so you could stick it in a satellite, then why not just keep living Altair's memories? <laughs> he, he kept the apple. And not only that, <laughs> but why would you be like, okay, time to kill Desmond? <laughs> Like if the whole plan is to, <laughs> if the whole plan is to take Desmond out of Abstergo and let him relive memories more organically, why is Alan Riken being like, kill that bitch? <laughs> like why is that? that why, you know, are you gonna tell me that Vidic and Lucy are planning this Project Saren situation, and not letting Riken know? Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it one bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyway, I just no, I couldn't you're stop right. Thinking, I mean, I couldn't stop thinking about that. I'd also anyway. imagine that. Okay, so so if, if Daniel reads the thing and he's like, and and Daniel's like, who is this Desmond? Uh, <laughs> then the Templars are gonna be like, huh? Well, let's search our assassin databases for anyone named Desmond. One of two things happens there. One is. Oh, uh, there's no one named Desmond. Guess we'll worry about this in 10 years. <laughs> the other thing is Desmond is the son of William Miles. And we know that William Miles is this really important assassin guy. Wouldn't they then just like capture him at that age? Like, I don't know what drives them to go after to him. To wait that long. Yeah. I mean, the idea is that the maybe the whole, ooh, Daniel was the reason that Desmond got captured. Maybe that's a little like they overstretched themselves. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, cause it's a thing too. It's, or they look in the database and they go, Oh, there's like 30 Desmonds. <laughs> it's a really common name. There are a lot of assassins. We don't know who it is. We have to spend the next 10 years narrowing that list down to the right Desmond. Yeah. We're going to have to vet all these Desmonds. <laughs> I did not mean uh, to ramble too much about that. that. That was just my uh, observation because look, it's an awesome detail. It is. Fun. This is what makes it makes it like a cool prequel item because it's like it gives purpose to Daniel finding this, you know, this Desmond connection. But what I will say, too, is I don't know if you agree on this, but in terms of like the modern to historical stories, they run parallel to each other, but mm-hmm. they don't they don't really like intersect like Daniel isn't looking for the shard. He doesn't no. find it. He's not like there's no kind of like. Um, he's point. only there living those memories because he wants to be right. And that's kind of neat though, too. It's kind of beautiful. Well, he, well, he wants a family. Uh, so he's living his family historical memories. Okay. Well, make me feel like a piece of shit, I guess. I just, <laughs> All right, well, okay. Well, but if what you're saying is an observation and not a criticism, then you're completely right. And I agree with no, you. No, no, I, no, I, I do agree with you. I, I guess I, I'm just so used to all of the historical stories um, somehow aiding or giving context to the modern day goal. It's interesting because it's an inconsistency that Abstergo is totally cool with letting Daniel just chill in his memories for like 14 months. <laughs> like, I, I mean, yeah, I get that they wanted to reward him after helping them out so much, but at the same time, like, are you guys just going to wait 14 months to enact your purge? Well, they were enacting it already they were just putting him in the animus to kind of like reward him for it yeah i mean yeah they didn't really use him in the purge interestingly enough they they let him dick around in russia and mind but they did they did have to like occasionally like mine him for information like hey like what the fuck happened with these pressure plates yeah (laughs) like hey man listen i know you're like busy in there and ship can you you wake up a little bit and just tell us how to get to the basement of this one building i'm so sorry i'm really sorry to interrupt and he's just like (laughs) pressure plates there's there's pressure plates in there okay cool all right we tried it there were pressure plates thank you daniel Go back to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Oh, good night. <laughs> that was it. We'll see you in seven months, buddy. <laughs> That's all I needed, buddy. I'll be sure to change your your, your bedpan in two hours. <laughs> because of, I, because you're just you're in a fucking coma at this point. <laughs> Catatonic state right now, man. <laughs> I love this book, and you know what? Here's the other thing too. We talk about the Desmond thing as far as this being a, a good prequel. For me, what really solidifies this as an excellent prequel is, one, it it looks at the story of Assassin's Creed and the context of the world and the fact that when we get into the Assassins at the start of Assassin's Creed 2 and we learn that, like, they're these kind of disassociated, scattered underdog cells and that they are really up against it with the Templars being this huge Abstergo corporation, right? Yes. And it says, how did it get here? Well, you know, we talk about a purge. We talk about a time that the assassins, they used to be doing better, but now they do a lot worse. So in the book, you get this one, two sort of punch of their guy losing the election, which is implied to be um, Al Gore, I guess. Right. You know, because he invented the Internet. They they really liked him for that. They wanted him to be the president. And then you have um, the fact that all of them fucking die. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it. It's I mean it sets the stage for how they are in the first game, like the way Vidic is like the, those were the last of your kind, 
you fuck. And that's what I miss about the story was just knowing what the stakes were. And I talked yeah, about we, this before. Yeah. Yes. We, we talked about it just recently about how like, it's like the assassins are doing the fucking greatest in one instance. And then they're getting, you know, destroyed in, in the other, you know, yeah. there, there's not a balance. In Assassin's anymore. Creed gold, they have enough money to like, you know, just bribe Aaliyah <laughs> With yeah, the fun hundreds of college. thousands of dollars. Yeah, we're gonna pay for your school, Aaliyah. You know, and like, <laughs> and then the next minute yet, it's like, oh yeah, but there are only these three people in the whole world that care about this potentially catastrophic Templar plot. So it's like really hard to tell who's who, what's what, who's winning. Right, and that's the thing is, I just don't think they care anymore. They just use it to their advantage when they want to, when they want to do a piece of like transmedia content, you, because they kind of have to. I mean, the only people that are listening to Assassin's Creed Gold, the only people that are currently reading any of the mangas that they're putting out, or you know, any of the spinoff comics that they do for the games, the only people who are taking in those things are fans. And so I feel like for nowadays, like with Assassin's Creed Gold, they have to take some aspects from the modern day to kind of like quench our thirst for it. But at the same time, it doesn't matter enough to Ubisoft as a whole to bring it home in the in, in, in the games. But the other thing I wanted to say about how good of a prequel this is, is that not only does it take that that opening in the story of how did the assassins get to be this, you know, disadvantaged in the context of the, the grander story, but it also right. uses that as an opportunity to tell what really is a pretty well constructed and well executed personal story for Daniel. Yes. I think it really is one of the, not just one of the best stories in Assassin's Creed media, but maybe one of the best like video game tie-in comics ever. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, there definitely, I think, was a lot more um, attention uh, from the brand itself. Because, I mean, you, you look at nowadays, and the comics are now finishing off stories that started in the games. You know, the the the, the comics are these just kind of, things off to the side that the real fans are experiencing. But I feel like when this was coming out, it was like people were still like, you know, just wanting anything from Assassin's Creed they could get. It was still this like new and cool thing. I'm not saying it's not cool anymore, but you know what I mean? Like they're kind of more like throwaway promotional tools now where the only real value to the brand of them having these comics on the shelf is that people walk into a store and see Assassin's Creed comics on the shelf. Right. It's not like they're really telling involved stories. Yeah. I mean, cause, cause I mean, this is the perfect example of like, this was an extension of the games. This was an extension of Assassin's Creed. This has something to do. It's impactful. It has something to do with the brand, but oh, you can start playing Odyssey and anything that happened in the comics in the past year is going to mean nothing yeah. in terms of Odyssey story. Yeah. There might be like a character mention or, or like a or like a single name that you know the I mean, the most eagle eyed fan will, will recognize. But let's be real. I mean, this is a franchise that they literally they did a theatrical, big budget blockbuster movie, and it did not incorporate or intertwine with the events of the games at all. At if all. If anything, it feels like it's a completely different continuity. And it doesn't, and there are inconsistencies. So if you can't make, if you can't take advantage of that kind of a storytelling opportunity, like we're going to put a big movie in front of everybody and have that make the games a richer experience the way that this comic makes the games a richer experience, you're, you're completely losing sight of what the goal should be on a storytelling level of having a transmedia franchise. I agree with you. The other thing I wanted to sort of celebrate about the book was that I just love the way it's paced, the sort of rhythm of how the modern day and historical scenes flow into each other. You know, one thing that yeah. any Assassin's Creed story kind of has to ask itself is what the relationship is between the modern and the historical. And you bring up an excellent point that it's not like they're looking for something in the past. It's just that these stories are playing out sort of next to each other on the page. And the right. fact that they found clever ways to weave in and out of that uh, is super impressive. Yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that so much as like I, I didn't like it. I, I, I suppose. No, I, I totally I just get what feel you're saying. Like at the end, when uh, Kenya is just kind of standing there with the hidden blade, like that doesn't really say much. In ter- like that doesn't. That's not like a reveal for me. Like, oh, you know, like, like that. That now adds context to what we see in the modern day. It's kind of just like, 
this that's where that's the story ends in me and which is and, why uh, i feel like and this is something i knew we were gonna have to talk about i feel like the fall is better than the chain yeah oh yeah but i mean can we address like what kind like what name what kind of name is the fall and the chain <laughs> Like the fall, you could say, oh, the fall of, you know, Russia. No, or, no, it's about know, the or, fall or, of the assassins. But what does the chain mean? Like the chain of what? <laughs> that I cannot answer. Is that, I mean, am I an idiot? No. Yeah, the chain feels less like, it's not as necessary to the story as the fall was. Although I do really, I, I found the training of Inokenti you know, to be emotionally very effective. He goes through some really tough shit at the hands of his dad. And I also liked the wrinkle that once Daniel goes from experiencing Nikolai's memories to experiencing Anakenti's memories, that he's like, fuck Nikolai. <laughs> All my homies hate Nikolai. <laughs> like he crumples <laughs> yeah, up yeah. a picture of him and he's like, fuck you, dad. And it's like, dog, you were that guy a moment ago. That That is an excellent point. It definitely like the bleeding effect definitely had a... Uh an effect on like just the way he was even viewing the memories from his own perspective. Yeah. The bleeding effect is fucking like, will, will, Hey, listen, <laughs> the bleeding effect will fuck you. Yeah. Up. Like, and this is the best portrayal of it in any of the Assassin's Creed media. And yeah. it uses it yes. to tell a story that in some ways is about like mental illness and is about, you know, the psychological effects. The, the story in a lot of ways is awesomely dark. And that's kind of the central. Oh, oh my God. Like this, the shot of Be Bellamy in a fucking in coma, just being harvested for memories. Yeah. Like that shit is like, whoa, fuck. Like there's an uh, actual shot where you just see a uh, bunch of Templars murder a bunch of children too. <laughs> yeah, like fucking youngling style. I feel like that's still emblematic of the fact they were really going for it with the dark shit in this book. No, yes, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. Assassin's Creed was very um, mature around this time. And then, you know, in especially in, in this comic, and then you get the comics, you know, yeah. more recently where there's like exploding teeth, <laughs> which is like the most cartoonish and goofy thing I've ever seen. I mean, and, and I think that really just goes to show something that was really important in the early games and, and in the early vibe of the world was just how fucked up it is to imagine strapping someone to a bed and harvesting their memories, their ancestors' memories. And now it's literally something that's happening when you play a video game, apparently. Like, yeah. the importance and the darkness and the sacrifice associated with that act of, like, we're going to go in there and we're going to zoom into your DNA and see what happened to your ancestors. That was explored really creatively in this book and has been completely forgotten about in the story over multiple games. And especially, like, in what we just talked about with Assassin's Creed Gold, I mean, I don't... I don't quite remember, um, maybe you can correct me here, but I don't really even remember like much negative side effects of the bleeding effect that um, Aaliyah experienced nope. in Assassin's Creed Gold. Like, They're always worried just, about it. They're like, we can't put her in yeah. too long. But it's purely a cheap tension creating device and it's not really right. anything actually Yeah, she real. gets all the benefits of like being able to not be claustrophobic and stab people, but she doesn't get any of the negative effects. Because the bleeding effect in the Animus and the Assassin Templar conflict, like it's, it's very fucked up. Uh, a lot of that stuff is fucked up and it's explored so... So well here, especially with how Daniel is in his adult life. You know, we interpret him at first like, oh, this fucking loser. But you got to think about it. Like, he never had a chance at a normal life. I'm just glad that he was able, like, to take those piercings out and get a haircut. <laughs> and then, like... A couple haircuts. And how handsome he become he became. A couple other interesting things I wanted to point out before we wrap this up is that um, this <clears throat> whole comic book was originally going to... While they still were planning, all of the Daniel Cross story was there from the beginning. The historical stuff was going to follow Ezio and not Nikolai. Really? Is that is, is that true? That is true. And I learned that in the book itself because the version I have is the Titan release of it, which has some behind the scenes stuff in the back. Interesting. You don't I, have that because you have the UB Workshop Subject 4 collection. Yeah, which I guess is inferior because you get nice behind the scenes in info. And it gives me like a few pages of what their like early demo pages of what the Ezio stuff was going to look like, which is pretty cool. Wow. 
That's I, I had no idea. They talk about you know, they talk about going to the St. Petersburg. Play podcast teaches me. So, <laughs> sorry, I completely just steamrolled you. I'm, I'm, I'm so no, sorry. No, no, no. Go I'm back sorry. to it. <laughs> no, I just was. I just was literally. I was saying the dumbest shit ever. I was like, you know, the Hook Play podcast teaches me so much. Like, like, like a dumbass. Just keep talking about St. Petersburg. <laughs> Well, now I don't want to. No! <laughs> All I was saying is that they they also had some really kind of unintentionally funny pictures of the creative team on the fall, like, drawing shit in St. Petersburg. And they're all, like, really thoughtful, like, pictures of just some dude sitting down with a notebook and, like, looking at the skyline. <laughs> and I was like, you Canadians, what are you up to? What are you doing? Yeah. What are you, what are you guys doing? I guess to kind of to summarize our thoughts on all this, The Fall in the Chain... Uh, They're both really good books, and they do a great job of presenting a vision of Assassin's Creed as a transmedia franchise that has a lot more internal consistency and takes a lot more creative advantage of its storytelling opportunities than a lot of the stuff these days has given us. Absolutely. I I completely agree. I mean, this was my second time reading it. um, I enjoyed it even more than the first time I had read it. Yeah. Um, I feel like now that we've seen how Assassin's Creed can kind of go off the rails it's a lot easier to appreciate what this book was doing. Whereas if you oh, read yeah. it when it came out or shortly thereafter, that was just, that was Assassin's Creed, baby. That's what it was. Yeah. And now, and now we're just looking back at the good old days. <laughs> so, you know, I think that about does it for this episode, but we want to thank you guys for listening. Um, especially if you've listened to our other episodes, we had a lot of fun on this one. One thing that you can do to support the podcast, if you don't already is subscribe to our YouTube channel, Um, But obviously we're available on multiple platforms. So anything you can do to support us, uh, sharing the podcast with your friends who like Assassin's Creed, uh, leaving comments on our YouTube video, on our Reddit posts, um, interacting with us on Twitter. We are at Hookblade on Twitter if you want to talk to us there. Uh, We really appreciate you guys engaging with us and telling us what you think. And we're definitely going to need some ideas for future episodes because we have really tiny, smooth brains and we can't think of that many things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, like Tim couldn't even think of a thing to say. I other couldn't. Than, yeah. I couldn't even think of another word to finish a sentence. <laughs> so we really need your help, guys. Please. We're also Please. definitely uh, open to having guests on the show. So if joining us to talk about something you really care about is something you're interested in, uh, drop us a line and let us know. Yeah, there is an application process. Um, <laughs> You first have to do a phone interview, and then we will actually fly you out in person. And yeah. And uh, and then, we'll ha- you know, hey, listen, just we'll have our people talk to your people. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, Thank you. I've been the blade. And I wait. <laughs> hold on. Hold on a second right there. <laughs> yeah, I have been the hook. I'm the blade. <laughs> and that's that's the black. <laughs> this has been the hook blade podcast uh, or the hook pod blade cast, whatever you want to call it. Um Thank you for listening. The hook and the blade. So you can use one or the other. An elegant design.